I met Chase Rosad at his home studio in New Hope, Pennsylvania, in the rolling hills of historic Bucks County. In addition to boasting one of the most extensive private collections of bonsai in the United States, the studio offers a complete range of bonsai supplies. His shop sells Japanese and domestic bonsai books and plant materials of all types are available from his greenhouse. What we're seeing out here is our display yard and also basically, I guess you could say, general sales area. Uh, these are the trees that uh, We've been working on some for a short period of time, from some for a long. Uh, but it gives you an idea of what we have, from deciduous to the maples to the elms, the nice evergreens. The tree behind us here is a uh, Japanese white palm imported tree. Uh, down there at the end, we have cypress. It has that equiseed in front of it, but uh, that's the one we've been working on probably 15, 18 years. So, but all of these are for sale? All of these are for sale. They're out in basically the full sun. They're temperate type of trees, trees that normally grow in our area. Uh, in the winter time, they would be, they will not be out here for the winter. They're so out here spring, summer, fall, them. and then they're wintered in a, uh, a wintering position. What do you have over here? Well, these are some of our, I guess you say, better trees, specimen trees. Why don't we take a little yeah. walk over and yeah. take a look right. at some of these. The Hinoki Forest. There are, I think, nine trees in this forest, and it's rather tall. It's a uh, cedar, it's a true cedar, uh, Camacypris obtusa. Yes. Has a nice smell, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Really yes. nice yes. smell. Now, this is indicative to what environment? Cedar, female? Well, there are, this particular plant is native to Japan, but uh, there are uh, trees that will grow like, we have the white cedar of the pine barrens in New Jersey, and then there are also a couple of this particular plant that grows in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, so it's much like this. It looks to me in reminds composition together of what some of the uh, big uh, Thuya or Pacific uh, Coast cedars are like. Now I see there's still wire here. Will no. there always be wire? Well, not. It really needs to be thinned out. It's giving more of a silo than an individual uh, appearance. We've just not taken the, uh, the wire off. And the wire really will come off this winter. Over there I see a, we a weeping willow. We have a weeping willow, and a little bit large for bonsai purposes, but it's a, it just gives you such a night in the spring of the year when the foliage is just coming out. It's one of these things that just makes you, you feel spring. Because the, that is deciduous. Isn't yes, it? loses leaves. It's like the wisterias in the spring or in the spring. It's just uh, there's something of, of interest each month of the year, whether it's flowers in the spring and fruit apples and the hawthorns and even the oaks that get acorns in the fall are, are one of those things, in the fall colors. So there's something for the 12 months of the year with both. The tree you're looking at is San Jose Juniper, who is nursery stock. The tree was purchased from a local nursery maybe 20 years ago as a landscape plant. It was so thick and so full that you could not see any of the line of the tree. You couldn't see the trunk, and it was just a rounded ball of foliage. It's been thinned out, opened up. The front part has been stripped, and it's what we call dead, or I call it driftwood, or a gin portion of the tree. It's been treated with lime sulfur to make it have the stark white look of it, uh, to give it the aged appearance. It's a rather large bonsai, and actually takes two people to move it. What we've got here is a raft planting. This is the center trunk, or common trunk, but these are the secondary trunks that have come off, and these are all put under the ground, and each one of these will become an individual tree. These are all side branches, and this will develop roots down underneath this trunk line. We keep this covered off over, and then the tree has to be wired. But it's a 11 tree forest off of one common trunk line or root system, classified as a raft. Chase and I sat in his studio workshop where he further explained the art of bonsai. The definition of bonsai really is a plant in a container. It's a plant in a container to create the illusion of a larger tree, of an older tree, only in microscale. 
Basically speaking, you can take anything as a bonsai, but a bonsai, the focal point is the plant, the tree, what you're working on. As I said, it's an art. The artistic end of it is be able to take this plant material, the plant that you're working with, the tree that you're working with, to manipulate, to create this appearance of a tree-like appearance. The horticultural skill is to keep it alive, not only for a day, a week, a year, but an extended period of time. And this is one of the problems that most people end up with. They get this plant. They, number one, they don't know where to keep it. This is a temperate type of plant. This is a plant that should be kept outside, should be grown outside. Now, what our, is this? This is a Chinese juniper. Uh, it's Junipers chinensis. It's one referred to as shimpaku by the Japanese. Uh, it's very soft. It doesn't bite at all. It has a nice texture foliage to it. And uh, it has a nice mm -hmm. smell to it. And uh, it's one that works out very well as a bonsai. It's not a native to this country. There are a lot of good native junipers. It's just going out and finding these things, but our, our country is a wealth of collecting material. And uh, this is one that has been grown as nursery stock. This is about 15 years old from a cutting. And when I said a cutting, a cutting is something like taking, I know I can cut that off, taking something like this and rooting it, mm -hmm. rooting something like this and, and, and growing. But now, was this started as, as a nursery, in a nursery, as a bonsai? This was started here 15 oh, okay. years ago, as a cutting, 15 years ago, maybe 14 years ago, as a cutting. Uh, it's been pruned pretty near every year, not with a particular shape in mind, but the, the main trunk line has been given some movement, some bend. So it's, uh, it's been grown with bonsai in mind on this particular plant. Now, bonsai is an ancient art. Yeah, it's an ancient art form. It's uh, pot culture. If you want to go back to pot culture, the Phoenicians, the Babylonians, the Egyptians all grew plants in containers. It was the Chinese that first started growing stylized plants in containers. And they refer to it as pen ching or pun ching, uh, meaning landscape within the confines of a container. So consequently, in, in the Japanese or Chinese bonsai or pen ching, you'll find little figures, little objects, oh, uh, sc scenery kind of things. And with bonsai, basically, you do not. It's the plant on its own. And bonsai has become the recognized terminology, even in China. They go most places, and they won't refer to it as pen ching. They'll refer to it as bonsai. Okay. Now, what do you plan on doing today with this one? Well, in, I, I was trying to do something a little bit different, something that maybe wouldn't take too much time, and I'm always accused of, of taking plants and doing a lot more to them than I originally anticipate. But I think the plant could be uprighted a little bit more. I have some wedges in here that I can, I can tuck underneath here, and if it works out, maybe upright it. And I'm visualizing the tree looks a little bit sparse. It looks a little bit heavy on one side. But I'm looking at this with the idea that the wind is coming from your side and mm -hmm. blowing off into this side. Uh, if I have the time and I can do it, I'll do a little bit of carving on the tree to make it look like it's gone through some of the torments. As I said, I, I have the feeling that I want the tree to come towards you. Uh, roughly, there's, uh, I'm going to make uh, some cuts. I'm going to, to get in and thin this tree out. I want the tree. Uh, to pick a front out, the front is going to be probably on this side. There is a front, there is a back to a bonsai, but ideally you want it to look good from all directions, from all sides. Are they fragile? No, they're not as fragile as people like to think they are. Uh, they may look fragile, they may give you that appearance of being a fragile tree. What I'm looking at now, I, I keep looking in here and you see me moving and as I said, a, a windswept breaks those rules, breaks the line. Uh, I'm looking for a cleaner look. I'm looking to say, all right, what don't I need? Because it doesn't want to be too fussy. It wants to be somewhat open. Um, if I get to something and I don't need a branch, I'm going to remove it. As I said, you look at old trees. Old trees have a tendency to be very open. And uh, I'm certainly giving these trees that tendency to be open. The back I want to have open so you can see the back of the tree. You can see through the tree. You can see the background. Now this branch already dips dramatically here. That's yeah, well, that's a nice thing. That's why I thought this would be, be a nice tree to develop as a windswept because it has very few branches on this side, has a lot of branching on this side. When I uprighted the tree from bending down, it gives me the feeling that the wind is blowing in this direction. But you know, the interesting thing about trees are people either look at paintings or look at uh, trees themselves or, or bonsai or trees in a yard maybe that have been sculpted. And uh, they say, do trees really grow like that? Well, as I said, I have a tendency to get around a little bit. And you see how trees grow. And they really do grow in some great, 
unusual Configuration. configurations. Uh, remember one time walking through the bristlecone pines in California, it was like walking through a Salvador Dali painting. If someone purchases one, can they expect that it's going to live many years? With care? Mm -hmm. It's like you and I. You know, you get up in the morning, you have to have your cup of tea or coffee or juice or what have you. Uh, you have to, uh, you have to take care of it. You cannot uh, uh, neglect it. It's, uh, you know, people bring trees in here all the time. They don't have to purchase them from us, certainly, but people are bringing trees in here and they say, well, you know, it's dying or it's dead or something's wrong with it. And, and you play 20 questions and you try to figure what did they do or what didn't so they do. you're a tree doctor. Oh, I'm a tree doctor, too. Time. I'm going to do a little bit of wiring on this tree. I'm going to uh, put some wire on. Wire is temporary. Wire is like a, uh, a brush to a painter. Or a brace. Is uh, it a brace? Well, like it's like a brace. a brace, yeah. The wire that I'm going to use happens to be copper wire. It's copper wire that has been heat treated. This has been electrically heat treated. I really like to take it and, and, and reheat it myself, either on the outdoor grill or uh, in our fireplace or someplace like that, which changes the crystalline structure of the wire and makes it a little bit softer to work with. Now, uh, is this the most crucial part? I mean, I can see where people might learn how to prune easily, but wiring is going to be more I difficult. I guess it's crucial. Uh, some people like the wire. I enjoy wiring. I had the opportunity to study with a bonsai master in Japan. Uh, he did a lot of wiring. He was very critical on his wiring. And it allows you to bend the branches. It's much like braces on teeth. It allows you to bend those branches in the direction and position that you want them to grow. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to wire these two branches. And I always wire two branches with one piece of wire. The wire is put on at approximately a 45 degree angle. I'm going to hold this taut underneath here. I'm going to bring the wire around underneath on up in through here. I have to make a second wrap around here to get it the way I want. Now the one thing about the wire, as I said, the wire is temporary. Left on the tree for a period of six months to a year. I'm going to bring this on over here. See, I'm still holding this. Mm -hmm. Bring it around that way. Now that's anchored there. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this around and under on top and around on this one. Well, I would think this is what really requires the skill. Well, it does, and it's... I mean, uh, it all requires skill, but... The gentleman that I studied with in Japan, when I would wire a tree, he would never say a word. He would always just come up and look at it very carefully, and I see a little space I have under there, but he would look at it very carefully. And then he, when I was finished, he would come along and he would say, ah, oh, crossover, mistake. And the answer was, take it off and start all over again. So you sort of learn that... Uh, you try not to make too many mistakes. Now this doesn't hurt the bark or the... Well, I make sure that I don't hurt the bark. Uh, it is possible to break. It is possible to skin the bark. You want to be careful that you're not doing that. And uh, really what I will end up doing before I... I like the wire. It's therapeutic. A lot of people don't like uh, wiring, but uh, you'll see that I've been doing some wiring on the tree. As I said earlier, wire to a bonsai girl is much like a brush to a painter. And I'm the kind of person that once I start, I never quite know when to stop wiring because there's always one more branch that has to be wired. It would look a little better this way. It would way. look a little better that way, right. And uh, almost finished doing what I, or completing what I've set out. But do certainly that. looks entirely different than it did before. Yeah. What I've done is that I put this on this ceramic slab to give us the feeling of, a, of a, actually a stone slab in a more of a naturalistic setting. I could have used the container. The gray container blends in with the, uh, with the tree, and I think it was a very nice container for the tree, but I just felt using this slab. And then also the possibility of creating an illusion here, which we're trying to create, was using some type of stone. The stones that I've, I'm going to use here are all collected up in northern New Jersey. 
uh, they're all from the same area. So when you put a stone in here, you want stones that are compatible, the same color, the same texture. You don't want something like the tufa here and two different types of stones. It looks like it's a dump quarry or something that the, you want it to look as much as you possibly can. The front is facing towards you. I'm going to turn this around so I can see this side and see how I can work these stones in here. Uh, the stones should look like they were here before the trees have started growing. Uh, that the uh, the stones were, were were not an afterthought. But this could be a, a sliver of uh, the northwest or the northeast. Absolutely. Looking up Absolutely. over the oceans. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It could be the coastline. Mm -hmm. You could change the textures of the uh, of the uh, the soils. You could you could put some colored gravel in here to. Uh, uh, just to give you the feeling of sand or a river edge or along the stream. But you can see how just a little touch of green in there is going to uh, help create it. Could be wildflowers and then moss planted over this. So that's a start. So bonsai again, a plant in a container to create the illusion of a larger older tree. And we get the feeling here that the wind is blowing across it. Now it's refinement. Uh, when is it going to look like a really neat, refined, old, masterful tree? Eight to ten years, probably. Uh, it'll look much better. Well, that reminds me of the things that are behind us. I, I noticed the one that's directly behind you um, has more than one trunk. It's an azalea. It's uh, multi-trunk. A bonsai can either be a single trunk tree or two, three, five, seven, nine, eleven trunks getting into forests. The, the, the azalea has five trunks. It's probably somewhere age-wise. Age is unimportant as far as bonsai. It's how old it looks to you. It's the illusion that you're trying to create with age. But that's an old tree that was discarded uh, on my doorstep probably 25 years ago. This is a spruce. Uh, this is actually a, a, a dwarfed Ezo spruce, which is a Japanese spruce. It was grown, it's about 20 years old, and it was started from a little cutting Yes, a little tip cutting when I was in Japan one time, picked up some cuttings, brought them back and rooted them. Magnificent. The Hinoki, it's a uh, Camisiparus, uh, probably age-wise 35 to 40 years. It came out of a dwarfed conifer garden in Doylestown, Pennsylvania about 20 years ago. Some people were selling a house and they had this planted in their front yard. And I came along and it was mm -hmm. mine. More about the art of bonsai can be seen in Chase Rosad's exhibit at the Philadelphia Flower and Garden Show, which is held annually at the Philadelphia Civic Center. Ada Shushard O'Connor was a Doylestown artist and friend to many. Ada's generous and loving spirit embraced many of us, and her smile and sparkling eyes were gifts of kindness and affection. Ada was tragically killed on August 12, 1987, in a car accident in Doylestown. She was 39 years old. Fortunately for us, Ada's sketches, paintings, embroideries, and tapestries will live on as a testimony to her artistic spirit. This segment of Artbeat will be a visual collage of Ada's work, coupled with quotations from her journals and commentary about her work. This is done in honor of a fiber artist and as a tribute to the permanence of art, which lives far beyond the life of its creator. I grew up in an environment enmeshed in art, where design, color, and function were everyday topics of conversation. So it was natural to me to pursue a career in the arts. Taking needlework from its traditional and practical approach, I have tried to develop a fresh and dynamic dimension for the medium. I work primarily in silk and cotton threads to create designs inspired by events, people and places that have had an impact on my life. Perspective, color and texture are all important to me and I enjoy exploring the artistic potentials of the medium through my abstract work. My work represents the passage of time. Each tapestry makes a personal statement. 
For me, there is a natural progression from my childhood memories to my experiences living in a variety of places, including the United States, France, and West Germany. My philosophy is one which mixes the joys of creativity with the emotions of the spirit. I am of the earth, but it is in the striving towards the heavens that my soul is enriched. To me, it has always been a question of color. Ada joined with other artists from all over the world in creating yard-long panels that would be joined to make up over 15 miles of a giant peace ribbon which was to encircle the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. in August 1985 as a symbol of love for the Earth and its people. Ada felt strongly about the peace movement and included this message in one of her last pieces. Ada was one of many fiber artists who collaborated with artist Judy Chicago on a piece entitled Hot Flashes, which toured the United States. Her part were thousands of French knots put together by the people in Doylestown with Ada's supervision as a part of the total work. Here is another sample sent to Judy Chicago of Ada's work. Doylestown, Pennsylvania was often a favorite subject of Ada. She often executed commissioned pieces for her clients. Her journals and sketchbooks were constant sources of inspiration for later works. Ada's wish for her funeral came from a Joan Baez song, You Suffered Sweeter for Me. Just one favor of you, my love. If I should die today, take me down to where the hills meet the sea and throw my ashes away to the winds and the sand where my song began. Ada's ashes were scattered to the winds and waters in the harbor of Washington Island, Wisconsin on Monday, August 17, 1987.